Good morning Interweb, World Builders Log 42. We are, as always, continuing to world build our fictional planet here, placeholder name Kretak. Last time we looked at rivers, this time we're going to look at weather. Specifically, fog, thunderstorms, and if we have time, auroras. Let's get world building. Once again, I'm going to be following, expanding upon, adapting the absolutely wonderful world building guide that Madeline James has created. Links in all the usual places to this. You gotta go check out her stuff. So let's start with fog. This one's gonna be really quick because I'm not gonna do this on camera. I have literally nothing to add to Madeline's method here. It's, as far as I'm concerned, pretty perfect. So all you gotta do is you just gotta follow her method verbatim, step by step, and you'll end up with something that looks a little like this. Blue here represents coasts that get fog during Northern Hemisphere winter. Pink, Northern Hemisphere summer. Purple, year round. And Madeline's method has some cool granularity to it. So like, for example, this coast here, inland, we have year round fog, but during Northern Hemisphere summer, the fog is also present out at sea a bit. Year round fog at the coast, Northern Hemisphere winter, fog out at sea. Delightful. Let's do some thunderstorms. So I'll do the thunderstorm maps on camera because I do have something to add to uh, Madeline's method. We're going to need two maps here. One for Northern Hemisphere Summer, one for Northern Hemisphere Winter. Let's focus on Northern Hemisphere Summer in this video. First thing Madeline has us do is mark out kind of various zones of influence to help us find where our thunderstorms will go. Broad strokes, I followed her method, but with a few sort of tweaks. So for my first zone of influence, I worked on my summer Northern Hemisphere Summer temperature map, and I marked out all the regions that were 18 degrees or warmer and that weren't arid or polar. And that selection looked a little something like this. Reason why we're doing this is that thunderstorms love themselves some warm conditions, but they're not found that frequently in deserts or polar climes. That's the first zone of influence. Second zone of influence, I took that same selection and just erased from it anything I considered to be a non-substantial landmass. So basically like all of these island chains in here, etc. That looks a little something like this. The reason why we're doing this particular selection is that the larger a hunk of land is, the greater its warming capabilities, the more convection there can be in the area, the more likely we are to get thunderstorms. That's zone of influence number two. For zone of influence number three, I whacked on my pressure maps, again, Northern Hemisphere summer, and I highlighted all the regions that are low pressure. Basically everything that isn't this orange or kind of swamp green color. And that looked like this. Oh, and also again, I took out the deserts and I took out the polar climbs. And for the final zone of influence, I marked out the windward side of kind of major mountain chains. And that looks something like this. And again, I got rid of any selections that fell into desert or polar regions. And the final prerequisite, like Madeline says, is to highlight whether or not your winds are cold or warm. So basically, if these winds came from a poleward direction, they get labeled as cold. If they came from an equatorward direction, they get labeled as warm. And that looks a little bit like this. With all those prerequisites in place, we have like all the factors needed to be able to kind of gauge where our thunderstorm regions will be. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and create a five level scale here to map our chances of there being thunderstorm, namely uh, low to none, basic, moderate, severe, and tornado. Now, these labels here, or these levels here are purposefully very vague by design, and that is a good thing, but me being me, let's make things a little bit more concrete. So to do that, we are going to compare the output of Madeline's method to maps of Earth. So this chap here comes from NASA. This is a map of the lightning activity on Earth, the average yearly lightning activity. The darker the region, or the redder the region, the more lightning activity there is. The cooler the region, so the more cyan and purpley the region, the lower the lightning activity. A shout out to Lake Maracaibo here, Bay. Now, comparing Madeline's maps and Earth maps, we can assign numbers to these levels. So low to none, we'll say is very roughly less than one lightning flash per square kilometer per year. Basic is one to five, moderate five to 15, severe 15 plus, and tornado is just its whole separate bag of problems. We'll talk about that in a little bit. With our key made and our color palette chosen, uh, we can start mapping these regions. And we'll start with basic, that's one to five lightning flashes per square kilometer per year. Basic is super easy. All we have to do is select all of our zones of influence 
and color them in. So in Photoshop, you can command click on the layer thumbnail to make a selection of said layer. This is my 18 degree plus zone. Then I can command or control and shift click on each subsequent thumbnail to add that to the selection. So let's add in our large land zone of influence, our low pressure zone of influence, and our windward side of the mountains zone of influence. With all four of those booted in, we'll select our basic layer, choose the correct color, and then alt backspace to fill that in. That is literally it, basic done. Now moderate, it's slightly more involved, but nothing too serious. Uh, we'll just turn off basic here for a second. I'll whack on the arrows and let's make a selection say of our first zone of influence, our warm regions, 18 degrees plus. For each of our zones of influence, anytime we have red arrows, warm, moist winds blowing into the region, we mark it as being moderate. So for example, if I zoom into this region here, you can see the selection here with the marching ants or not as the case may be. It's very hard to see. I do apologize for that. But we have a bunch of red arrows coming into this region. So we would mark that in as being moderate. Something like that. Rinse and repeat all over the globe for each of our four zones of influence. Time lapse mode engaged. Okay, gone through all of the zones of influence. That should be the moderate layer done. Here is what we got so far. Very nice. Final layer, severe. So for severe, we have four zones of influences, right? We have our warm region, 18 degrees Celsius plus, our large land masses, our low pressure zone, and our windward side of mountains. Any place where three or more of these influences are acting on a region at the same time, we we'll mark that place as being severe. 15 plus lightning strikes per square kilometer per year. So here are all the possible combinations of three or more of these factors. It's simply a case of making the selection and then coloring in, dead easy. So if we go for the first one here, all four influences, we go into Photoshop, we'll start with our warm layer, 18 degrees C plus, command click to make that selection. And then the next layer up, large land layer, right click on the thumbnail and select intersect transparency mask. That'll only highlight the regions that are both subject to the warm zone of influence and the large land zone of influence. Then we go up to low pressure, right click on the thumbnail, intersect transparency mask, up to the windward side of mountains, right click on the thumbnail, intersect transparency mask. And now we have all the regions selected where all four zones of influences are at play at once. We select our severe color then, go to a severe layer, option backspace to fill that in. Boom. Rinse and repeat for the other combinations. All right, severe, done. And now we can fill in all the remaining land areas with just low none, less than one lightning strike per square kilometer per year. Beautiful. That is basically thunderstorms done. All we need to do now is just make a few small refinements to make this map look a little more like the earth maps. So first things first, see the way we got a bunch of severe and moderate zones quite far poleward. But I don't think we'd expect to see this. Like if we look at this map here, moderate slash severe is basically your dark orange to red to black sort of region. You notice they are, are pretty much a tropical thing, save for the states here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the 18 degree ISO terms to delineate things. So I'm going to throw on my temperature map. And I'm gonna make a selection of all the regions that are 18 degrees or cooler. Pro tip here, we hit W on the keyboard to bring up your magic wand tool, go up to the top here, deselect contiguous. And then if you click on the color, it will select all of that color anywhere on the artboard. Super useful here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select all the relevant colors. Like so, that's everything cooler than 18 degrees. I'm gonna troll back on our thunderstorm map, go to my moderate layer and then hit the layer mask icon and then hit Commander Control I to invert that. And you'll see that has limited the moderate zones to be within the 18 degree isotherm, 18 degrees or warmer. So here's before and there's after. Alt click and drag that layer mask onto severe. So we can also limit severe as well. 
Next thing is range shadows. So notice that any pretty much any time we have a significant mountain range, you can get significant thunderstorms on one side, but then in the rain shadow, you basically don't get anything at all. So I'm going to emulate that here. I'm going to uh, locate all of my high mountain ranges and I'm going to decrease by one step any of these zones in the rain shadows of those mountain ranges. So we come into here and we throw on our wind map. We'll see we got winds coming in this way. This is the windward side of the mountain range. Here on the other side is the rain shadow. It's moderate, so we would raise that down to basic. This part severe, so we'll raise that back down to moderate. That's the basic shtick. Rinse and repeat, whole map. Time lapse mode engaged. Those are rain shadows done. That took a not insignificant amount of time, but I think it looks good. Now, technically what I should do now is I should go in and like say we have a region of basic here and then severe. We should really create a transition zone like through moderate. I might do that off camera because it's literally just like, you know, painting colors in between other colors. Not much to talk about there, you know. Thunderstorms done. Let's talk tornadoes. Okay. For tornadoes, we are going to attempt to find our like tornado alleys. So that is the regions on our planet where tornadoes are at their most concentrated. The frequency of tornadoes is at the is at its highest. That's with the caveat that much like thunderstorms, every part of the planet can get tornadoes. Like within my lifetime, uh, I've experienced two tornadoes in Ireland. Not personally, but they've occurred in Ireland. And Ireland doesn't even register in terms of tornado frequency on the global scale. So we're only looking for the highest concentrations. And essentially these will occur predominantly between about 30 and 50 degrees north and south. You can go more equatorward if you want, see China, but you probably don't want to go too far more poleward. They occur particularly in regions where you have dry air, cold dry air coming in over a mountain range, like say the Rockies, meeting warm moist air at the base of the mountains. Whole bunch of mixing, tornado happens, no crack for anyone. So we're going to do this here. And oh, also, tornadoes will only mark them in in the summer hemisphere. Because that's when, again, they'll be at their most potent. When the tornado alleys will be really alleying, you know. So let's see what we can do here. I'm just going to set up some layers. There we go. We got our wind layer on. And I've just I've put on my severe layer and dropped the opacity a little bit. All right, let's see. Can we find some locations? Immediately, my eye is drawn to this region of Esri here. We got flat plains, well, okay, relatively flat plains happening here. We got cold air coming in over this giant plateau here. Cold air up high, meeting warm air down low here. And we'll say there's plenty of moisture present due to the winds coming in off the Bay of Esri here. So I think this is a good location for a tornado. So I'm going to draw in a little blob here, say in this region. One tornado alley, done. Now, admittedly, you probably wouldn't get a whole bunch of action in the center of this low pressure zone, but we can easily see that moving about the place. Could be more here, for example. So I've no problem with this. Similarly, over here on Janner, we have a somewhat analogous situation. We have a bunch of air. Now, although we did mark this as being warm here. Hmm, on second thoughts. I don't think that's very warm. Air is coming in from polar direction down over the Rift Valley here, cool air up high, meeting at least in part air that's kind of traveling laterally. So it's going to be warmer than what's coming in here. So I think we could have a smaller tornado alley happening up here. And despite the topography being a little bit lumpy and bumpy, the changes in elevation are so slight here that this totally constitutes a plane. So I'm going to say maybe something small like that. And that's basically it. I can't see any other good candidates for tornadoes. Again, looking only at the summer hemisphere. All right, and that is our completed thunderstorm tornado map. As always off camera, I went ahead and did the other season. So this is Northern Hemisphere summer. And this boil is Northern Hemisphere winter. Summer, winter, summer, winter. Here they are side by side, delightful.
I've been recording all day. Do I have time for auroras? Do I want to do auroras? Yeah, let's let's do some auroras. Okay, auroras slash northern or southern lights. Y'all know what these are. I'm not going to explain it. Madeline's method here is chef's kiss. Simple and to the point. Mark in rings between 60 and 70 degrees north and south on both hemispheres. And in these regions, you'll get frequent northern and southern lights. Deadly. But we can push this a little bit further. So as Madeline notes, northern and southern lights occur in a thing called the auroral oval. This boy here, essentially a donut shaped region around the geomagnetic poles. That's important. Where the probability of seeing frequent auroras increases the closer you get to the pole and decreases the further away you get. You can divide the auroral oval into kind of three zones, the kind of, I guess, primary auroral oval, where you'll see frequent, very frequent northern and southern lights. The sub auroral oval zone, God, that's really hard to say fast. Here, the probability of seeing auroras drops. And then the final zone, the solar storm zone, is where you'll only really see aurora on extremely rare occasions when the sun is undergoing like a significant solar storm. So remember the important thing, it, this oval is centered on the geomagnetic pole, not on the axis of rotation. So we kind of are at liberty to place this auroral zone wherever we kind of want, based on like who or which continents we want to give auroras to. So the first thing is, where should we place our geomagnetic pole? Now, I don't know an awful lot about this, so someone in comments let me know, but as far as I can see, we're kind of at liberty to place the geomagnetic poles wherever we want. But if you want to avoid kind of unforeseen complications, we should maybe keep it close to where it is on Earth. So like here we have the North Pole, the geographic North Pole, it's like 10 degrees away latitude, we have the geomagnetic pole. So as long as we're in that kind of ballpark, we can't go too far wrong. At least I don't think so. And the second thing to note here is that according to Wikipedia, the auroral zone lies between 10 and 20 degrees from the geomagnetic pole and is typically three to six degrees wide in terms of latitude. Now, obviously, we don't have to use those exact figures. We can play around a little bit. So let's pop into G-plates and do some mapping. So for first time ever in the many, many years of me looking at G-plates, I'm going to use this tool, the what's it called? The Create Small Circles tool. Click on it. Over on the right here, it goes Specify Center and Radii. Click on that bio. And now we're going to center a circle. So we're going to basically pick our geomagnetic North Pole. So I'm just going to make up some numbers here. So something within 10 degrees of the actual axis of rotation, which would be 90 degrees. So let's say 82.8, something like that, latitude and longitude. Again, it could be whatever, there we go, random number. And what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna select multiple radii because we wanna plot out those multiple zones. We'll start about 10 degrees away from the geomagnetic pole. And let's say for argument's sake, each of the bands within our rural zone is 10 degrees latitude. So we want three zones, so we want to go out to 40 degrees in steps of 10 degrees. And if we go preview, we should be able to see a nice auroral band. So there, this first inner ring will be our auroral oval, then the sub-auroral zone, and then the solar storm zone. So then we can hit close and we can go create features, give it a plate ID, let's say one, give it a name, north auroral zone, distant past, distant future, none of this actually matters next and i'll just put it into my aurora folder create boom done so that's the north we need something similar for the south and it has to be directly antipodal to what we've drawn so we'll click on our small circle tool again we'll go specify center and radii and the way you do this is you take whatever latitude value you put in and you make it negative so you flip it to the other hemisphere and then for the longitude you add 180 onto the longitude so that is in this case 139.81, I believe. And then we keep everything the same. We can go preview and we should see a set of rings. How delightful. Let's close that. Let's go into rectangular view. Wonderful. That looks antipodal to me. Create features. Same shtick as before. All right. Auroral zone done. It's just a matter of exporting this, dumping it back into Photoshop, you know, creating a key, color coding, all that jazz. And you got yourself one auroral map. And if you were unhappy with where this placement is, you can simply move the geomagnetic pole. And then this zone, this wave, the sort of sine wave looking thing will move around the planet, which I think is really cool. And you kind of really can design where you want these things to go. 
Okay, that is us, I think, done, done. We mapped out our northern and southern lights. We talked a little bit about fog and we mapped our northern hemisphere summer and northern hemisphere winter thunderstorms. Join me next time where we'll continue to go through Madeline's methodology, figuring out our winds, dust storms, sandstorms, blizzards, polar vortexes, all that delightfully head-wrecking weather stuff. I hope you'll join me. So, thanks for watching. Thanks to Madeline for writing her wonderful world building guide. Thanks to Ross Bay Geo for the continued geographical advice. He and I have spent hours talking about and editing these maps. A delight. Shout out to the patrons. Love y'all. And until next time, it grouse.